Thank you for joining me here today for this National Science Foundation Graduate Research Fellowship Program. My name is Dr. Matthew Pluster with the University of Utah Graduate School's Office of Fellowships and Benefits, and I'm also the coordinating official for the National Science Foundation Fellowship here on this campus. So brief agenda of what we'll cover today is what is the NSF GRFP, what are the fellowship benefits, the eligibility for this, various eligible STEM fields, application components, some application tips and reminders, and then we'll go through a series of frequently asked questions, after which we'll stop the recording and then you'll be able to answer any questions that you might have at that time. If you do put any questions into the chat box between now and the end, um, we'll get to those at the end of the presentation. Okay, so what is the National Science Foundation GRF? So this is uh, one of the oldest uh, government subsidy programs for uh, graduate students, and it is designed by the NSF to ensure the vitality of the human resource base of science and engineering in the United States, and to also reinforce the diversity, diversity of scientists, diversity of disciplines, diversity of environment. Uh, the GRFP has a long history of selecting recipients who achieve high levels of success in their future academic and professional careers and become lifelong leaders that contribute both to science, innovation, and um, teaching. So one thing to remember with fellowships like this is the NSF is not investing in your research, they're investing in you, you as a researcher, you as a scientist, you as a future leader. Um, so as they list here in their blurb, past fellows do include um, Nobel Prize winners. About 42 or 43 previous GRFPs later went on to be Nobel scientists, um, former top government officials, Silicon Valley leaders, among many others, including college presidents, deans, uh, science lab leaders, etc. So it is a pretty prestigious award and does carry a lot of cachet to be a part of this program and to have that on your CV or resume. The fellowship provides a number of benefits. Uh, it's five-year fellowship that, cover, that provides funding over three years. So this does allow you to have a little bit of flexibility to get lab research experience working for your PI. Some of your programs require that the grad students complete a year of being a TA. Um, so that does give you a little bit of flexibility to use your uh, fellowship dollars when it's going to be most effective for you. Um, some students choose to work in a lab their first two years and then spend the next three years after that on the fellowship. Uh, that way they've honed some good research skills, um, some good lab skills. And then after the second year, they've passed their calls and their comprehensive exams, and they're ready to hit their research and are ready to devote more time to that. In addition to $37,000 a year for each of those three years, the fellowship also does cover tuition. Uh, so if you go to a school like the University of Utah, that covers your base tuition, your uh, as well as fees and differentials, like those of you who are in science or engineering, you have those additional fees in addition to your base tuition. So the GRFP would cover that. And NSF also does provide career and life balance, such as family leave, medical leave, and access to other professional development opportunities, namely the NSF intern program. Ad additionally, if you use your fellowship here at the University of Utah, we cover your health insurance during your years of tenure, your funded years. And for each of those three years, we will also cover $2,000 of research expenses. So if you uh, need to go to a conference, that $2,000 can cover conference fees, travel. If you need equipment for your research uh, in your lab, that can cover that as well. Some students use this funding to buy a new laptop or iPad to support their education. Um, and then additionally, some faculty advisors will offer an additional fellowship bonus. There are parts of this campus where the college will provide uh, $2,000 more. The PI will add a few thousand dollars on top of that as well. So if you choose to use your fellowship outside of the University of Utah, which is very mobile, it can go to any United States institution with a qualifying graduate program. Um, 
that's one thing that you'll want to ask. Uh, do, do you provide additional benefits for you bringing that fellowship with you? Some other important benefits to consider here is, as I mentioned, there's the mobility. Um, you can take this anywhere in the United States that has a, a master's or PhD program in your research area. And uh, some students choose to study here at undergrad, go elsewhere, stay here for their grad school, or uh, it's becoming less uncommon that we see students transferring mid-PhD. Um, so that does give you that power to, to move as you need to, as necessary. <laughs> Occasionally, this can also provide you a step up in graduate admission. I've heard numerous stories of students being waitlisted or even rejected for limited spots in PhD programs, and they call up the program and say, well, I'm actually coming in with my own funding. I have NSF GRFP, and uh, that can provide quite a bit of a boost to being admitted into a program. As mentioned, this also does provide prestige and recognition. To be recognized by the National Science Foundation as a graduate student or upcoming graduate student for you undergrads who are joining us here today, that does say quite a bit about you, your potential, as well as um, where you are right now, <laughs> excuse me, as a student and as a scholar. So that is uh, something to, that is very valuable. Additionally, this does boost your resume and your CV when you begin uh, on the job market, whether that is an academic and research job market or uh, alternative to academia uh, in the private sector, that does still carry, excuse me, quite a cachet. And additionally, and this is particularly salient for those of you who are looking at careers in academia as faculty, as researchers, pursuing this opportunity establishes a pattern of seeking external funding and fingers crossed getting the external funding, which when you are a PI leading a lab and teaching in a graduate program, that's going to be an expectation of your program, bringing in funding to support your grad students. And so establishing that pattern now as an incoming grad student or a current grad student, that's going to carry a bit of weight as you go on the job market down the road. Eligibility for this is set by the National Science Foundation. You must be a United States citizen, national, or permanent resident. I get questions every year of could, could we be flexible on this or that? Unfortunately, the University of Utah has zero say in the eligibility um, as that is set by the federal government. You must be a rising senior at the time of application. So the applications are due in October. So if you are a junior, we have mostly undergrads with us today. If you are a junior right now and you will be a senior this fall, you are eligible. If you're a senior right now, you're eligible as well. And if you will be a first year grad student in October, you're eligible. If you are going to be a second year grad student in October, you are also eligible. Um, Non-traditional students are welcome and quite, uh, quite highly encouraged to pursue this opportunity. Um, many students forego pursuing fellowships like the NSF, the NIH, among others, because they're, they don't fit that mold that they feel describes a typical grad student, uh, 25 fresh out of undergrad, um, but they may be in their 30s or their 40s. If that describes you, we do encourage you to please do, if you meet the eligibility, please do pursue this opportunity. Um, and you must be enrolled or intend to enroll in a research-based master's doc or doctorate in an eligible STEM field. And so this kind of gets people at times. I'm not in a grad program right now, whether I'm still an undergrad or I've taken some time off between undergrad and grad. Uh, that's fine as long as when the fellowship begins, which would be fall 2024, you need to be in a research-based graduate program in an eligible STEM field by that time. And we're going to go through this pretty quickly here. Uh, won't read off every specific area here. And as mentioned, this will be on the website. This is also on the National Science Foundation annual solicitation that you can refer to. Um, but I'll go over a slide for each of the, what we call panel. So chemistry here, there are various areas in chemistry and you will identify uh, your application as I'm doing chemistry research as uh, chemical theory models and computational methods. So you will select an area within that panel. Um, and so 
this is going to be where your research aligns, which usually means if I am a chemistry major, my uh, my area of research will be on the chemistry panel. That is not always true. You might be a chemistry PhD student and you might be on a life science uh, area of finite research. So your degree area and your research area might have a slight differentiation and that is okay. So we have chemistry, computer and information sciences and engineering. This is going to be more on the CIS, uh, computer science side of things, not engineering in the more broader sense, um, as we have engineering here as well. That includes quite a gamut of engineering, uh, both in the earth science and in more traditional areas of engineering. Geoscience, life science, materials research, mathematical science, physics and astronomy, psychology, social sciences, and STEM education and learning research. I'm sure it was social sciences. Uh, just a reminder, uh, make sure that you are on mute, uh, just in case you're having conversations that you don't want uh, others and uh, a digital audience to hear as well. Uh, so those are the areas that you have to identify with. Your research needs to identify with one of those panels and one of those areas on the panel. Uh, who isn't eligible? Who isn't supported by the NSF GRFP? Joint degree programs such as an MD, PhD, or JD, PhD, MSW, PhD. Um, students in professional programs like business administration, MBA, a MAC degree, MSW, counseling, social work. History is not eligible unless it, it pertains to the history of science. Education is not eligible unless it uh, pertains to STEM education and more in the research of STEM education rather than preparing to be a science teacher. Um, so there's a bit of a differentiation there. If you have questions on that, happy to meet with you one-on-one uh, -on -one to discuss. And other professional programs such as public health, public administration, public policy, legal sciences, or legal studies, library science, etc. Research within disease-related goals, unless you are on a biomedical research area. Clinical research, that is patient-oriented research, epidemiological and medical behavioral studies, outcomes research, health services research, as well as pharmacy research, pharmacological, non-pharmacological, uh, behavioral interventions, et cetera. So if, this, I, if you identify with this, there is a little bit of a small um, differentiation here. If, if, if you are outright doing pharmacological research, then you would not be eligible. But one question is I get, get regularly, particularly for those of you in biology, neuroscience, genetics, is I'm, my research is in something that is not health related, not human care, not patient care related, um, but it can have an impact on medicine. So for example, you might be studying um, a, a neuro principle that, that could really relate more to broader biology. That's great if it can have a broader impact into medicine, but if it's your primary area where you are studying uh, neuroscience, uh, specifically studying Parkinson's research, for example, that might be more of an ineligible area. If this describes you, again, happy to have one-on-one -on -one conversation about your specific area of research or interest area. Okay, now into the application components. There are three uh, components that you must have for your application to be complete. Transcripts, statements, and letters of recommendation. We'll go over those individually here. Transcripts must be listed on your application, uh, or you must list on your application all the post-secondary institutions that you've attended. So if you went to a community college, you need to list that. If you went to a four-year institution and then transferred to another four-year institution, both must be listed. If you attended uh, grad school already and you have grades by the time of the October application, so if you will be applying as a second-year grad student, 
you will need to have that grad uh, that graduate institutions transcript included as well. So you must include and list all degree granting institutions, even if you did not receive a degree. Um, if you are applying as a first semester and institution, so let's say that uh, October when the applications are due, you are a first year grad student in October or a first year senior student at a new institution. Uh, you, therefore, you don't have a transcript with grades already listed. In those cases, an enrollment verification form is sufficient. Um, you go to the registrar's office at your institutions to obtain transcripts. You would also go there for enrollment verification. That would not be through your PI or through a department admin. That would be through the registrar's office. Then two different statements. We have the personal statement and graduate research plan statement. And both of these must include broader impacts and intellectual merit, um, specifically in each of the, those two statements and under a uh, specific header. Uh, that is a relatively new in the past couple of years requirement, and it is a hard requirement. If there's not a header for intellectual merit and broader impacts, your application will not be reviewed. Um, and then you will also, in both of these statements, want to develop a consistent theme to weave together your personal story and your academic career interests and goals. In your personal relevant background and future goal statement or personal statement, you will have three pages, single, state, sing, single spaced Times New Roman, one, uh, 12 point font, one inch margins, all that is listed in the, the solicitation. Um, this is where you're going to tell your story. It's your personal statement. So this is going to be about you, not, uh, uh, it's going to be about you and why you're pursuing science, why you're pursuing your interests, not uh, going in depth about your specific research uh, project that you are proposing. So what motivates you? What inspires you? What drew you into this area of study? Um, show how you've taken initiative, how you face challenges, and importantly, how you've overcome those challenges. You'll describe your project your projects, your contributions, and your future goals. This is both relating to science and not relating to science. Um, and then again, intellectual merit and broader impacts labeled individually. Um, we want to avoid narr certain narratives here. Um, for example, my mother, uh, my grandmother died of cancer, so I decided to be a scientist. I see this a lot in essays for fellowships and scholarships. That doesn't really tell us why you, you chose a specific area of science. So you would want to say something more like my grandmother's passing of cancer piqued my interest in science. And I know I'm kind of watering this down still a bit here, which led me to studying chemistry in undergrad, which led to, which led to, which led to. So illustrating the chain of events uh, rather than just saying there's this one point that, that pivoted your your interest into science that show the chain of events. Uh, you also want to avoid narratives like I'm pers pursuing a career as a scientist because I want to change the world. I would see this quite frequently when I worked with scholarships and fellowships for uh, undergrads, such as those coming in as uh, from high school. They say, I want to be a doctor because I want to, uh, I want to heal people. I want to help people. Well, our doctors, our physicians, the only ones that help people, teachers help people, arguably nurses do more work with the, the direct help and care of someone. Um, social workers, counselors help people, arguably lawyers and bankers can help people as well. So why is that the best way for you to help someone? So you'd want to say, I'm pursuing a career as a scientist in, let's say, chemistry, because it combines my interests with research and innovation, with my skills and background in chemistry and physics. So you wanna match up your acumen and your skills and your uh, with your interests. So how, how do the two make your proposed plan here uh, of pursuing this graduate research education the best fit for you? That's what how you'll want to describe uh, your interests and your path. Your research plan statement is going to be two pages, single spaced, Times New Roman 12 point font, one inch margins. Describe your research idea, and in that you wanna include uh, some very salient points, a brief background and summary of what the project is and what led you to choosing that. You want to discuss your scientific approach. What scientific methods will you be utilizing? And what are your predictions? What's your hypothesis at this point? 
Uh, you'll want to describe what you expect to learn. So not just what is the, the prediction, what the direct outcome will be, but why those methods? Why that particular approach? How will that serve as a learning experience for you as well? You want to recognize and describe the risk. What's your plan B if the project does not go as planned? This is really important here. Um, program officers as well as reviewers say that this shows maturity in your research, that you've really considered various aspects. COVID was something that really threw us into this particularly because we had students conducting research and then everyone got sent home. We had students conducting field research in other countries, immediately sent home. We had students wanting to go work in certain labs, labs were closed. We had uh, all sorts of plan A's that were uh, brought down and we had to go into plan B. And so that really does show that there, there's an element of risk. Uh, for example, a few months ago, I was advising a student who is conducting research, um, anthropological research, utilizing dental records in Egypt. And she was really banking on her access, and she did have a relationship with the proper authorities in Egypt. Uh, so her getting access to do the uh, to do dental um, studies uh, with the artifacts was pretty likely, and that was her plan A. But what if COVID again shut down and she couldn't travel internationally, or what if? Uh, her access to that government organization was no longer there. What would plan B be for her and her research? And she identified, well, there is um, completed data already that I can use. Dental records have been examined by another researcher. So I would have that raw data that I can pull into my research. That's a plan B. So you want to think about what pivot you would have to make and you want to describe that pivot. Um, because the people who are going to be reviewing this are going to be researchers. They have been advising PhD students for many years. And so they have a pretty good idea of, oh, there are so many roadblocks with this proposal here. What happens if this doesn't happen or this doesn't happen? You need to be able to uh, exhibit in your, your statement, you, you're thinking about that pivot. You're, you're acknowledging that certain things are not a given and that there's an element of risk. Um, okay, moving on. Evidence of how you think. Why are you choosing this approach? How, uh, how does this relate to other research you've done? Um, you need to have a clear and uh, well-designed statement for, uh, about your project. It needs to be clear, needs to be concise. Um, it needs to be um, easy to understand as well. You might be studying anthropology, but you will be reviewed by an engineer. Um, you will be reviewed by a scientist, but will not be a scientist in your specific finite area of research. And the likelihood of it being a uh, scientist in just your department in your broader discipline, like uh, chemistry or biology, that is also on the slim side. Um, so, but you will be reviewed by scientists in relevant STEM disciplines. So you want to make sure that you're not speaking too jargony, too, too technical in that super finite area. Uh, one thing that we do say is a, a sign of a good research statement, and not just for NSF, but just in general, is being able to talk about a complex idea and breaking it down in a way that anyone who reads it will understand what you're trying to accomplish. We might not understand what that particular methodology is, or the epistemological approach is, or the how the research is actually done, what, you know, using certain common experimental uh, methods, but we have a good idea of you're going to study this, you're going to do collect your data this way, you're going to analyze it, and you hope to have X Y Z outcome. Um, so if your creative writing roommate can understand your research statement, they might again they might not understand the minutia, but they have, walk away with a good understanding of what you're doing. That's a well well written research statement. And then again, because I cannot say this enough, label your research plans intellectual merit and broader impacts. Without that label, it will not be reviewed. Intellectual merit uh, and broader impacts, I mentioned this a few times, so what is this? Intellectual merit is the potential to advance knowledge. It is, uh, this is where you will discuss how your 
proposed research will advance knowledge and understanding in not just your field, but how will it impact others in other areas of study? Um, how is this cross or interdisciplinary? That sort of um, that sort of uh, um, expanse of knowledge. How will your research help others be better researchers, scientists, and innovators in the future? Broader impacts is the potential to impact society and your community and contribute to the achievement of specific desired societal outcomes. So how will your proposed research benefit your local community? And local is what is local to you and your research? That might be how does your research have the potential to impact the Salt Lake and Utah communities? That's one way. Um, how will this impact um, uh, I was advising a student the other day who was doing research uh, on frogs that had something to do with ecological study that is going to impact wetlands and even how zoos and nature refuges uh, have healthy healthy environments for amphibians and reptiles. And so uh, for her, that community would be a more ecological community, um, nature reserves, national parks, wetlands, et cetera, not Salt Lake City per se. And then both, again, label. And so this is a brief little matrix. And again, you'll have this presentation online to refer to uh, with the intellectual merit, uh, broader impacts, and you, your personal statement, and your work, your research plan. So intellectual merit describe describing you in your personal statement is going to be, what is your motivation? What is your ability, uh, your skills, your strengths? What is your research experience in general? Not necessarily in your specific area, but do you have research area experience in other things? Maybe you worked as an undergrad research assistant in a lab uh, for chemistry, but you're pursuing biomedical engineering. Um, so might not quite match up with what you're trying to do, but that is still research experience that you have engaged in. How have you prepared as a student, as a scholar, as a researcher? Um, your perseverance, again, what are those challenges you face and how have you overcome those challenges? And what are your personal future goals here? Um, as you being a scholar, as you being a professional, um, as I say with a personal statement, you need to describe your past, present, future. Your past is what led you to college. Um, your present is in college. What have you achieved as an undergrad? What do you hope to achieve as a graduate student? And in the future is not later while I'm conducting my PhD research. Later is what's the next 30 years for you? Um, what goals do you have in the many years to come once you've completed your research and your education? Your intellectual merit with your work is going to be specific to that research project. Describe your topic, your the innovation therein within that project, the rigor of that experiment, the creativity, the new knowledge that you intend to generate, and the contributions to existing science. And the broader impact for you on your personal statement will be your background, your personal story, how you have uh, participated in a broader community. This is where you can talk about, you've held leadership positions, maybe not in science, but in your youth organizations, in your church, in your um, campus clubs uh, and other interest areas. Um, this is where you describe different uh, initiative that you've taken. This could be in the workplace, this could be in your studies, this could be uh, in a more broader background. And with your work, this is where you're going to describe the foundational nature and relevance of your research project, the importance to society, and what is the, the broader impact of your, your research to other disciplines, or how is this going to impact scientists in your area of study in generations to come. Some advice on these two statements is, remember, and I mentioned this already, this is not just for scientists, but future leaders. So the NSF is not funding you or your, your research, they're funding you. They're funding you as a researcher, you as a scientist, you as a future leader. And I apologize, I can see, you can see the window washers behind us where uh, the park building is being cleaned up for commencement next week. Um, you also want to convey who you are in the narrative. 
uh, the potential of an individual is, an, is, is evaluated, not just the proposed research. So you as a leader, you as an individual, um, and you want to use scientific terms. Uh, don't be too jargon heavy. We've talked about this already. You want to be, uh, uh, you want the average re uh, reviewer to be able to read this. Who are the reviewers? We've talked about it. This is other professors, other scientists. Additionally, when are they doing this? They're doing this over Christmas break. So while their their partner and their kids are saying, let's go sledding, they're they're locking themselves in, in their study to read a handful of applications that they want to get through without too much burden so that they can go sledding as well. Um, and so you don't want them to have to be reading your, your statements and pulling out a dictionary or looking things up on Google of what are they talking about when they say this? You want this to be easy for them to read. And this leads to something that I, I, I want to accentuate here is, um, don't tell us what you think we want us to hear. Tell us what is relevant to you. We can see really quickly, oh, they think this is what I want to hear. Well, what we want to hear is about you. So tell us about you. Tell us about your background. Uh, what we do want to see is it organized, it clear, it concise. Your reference letters, the final component after your transcripts and your statements, you need two reference letters. Two is required. Up to, if you have three, three will be reviewed. Um, if you have one or zero, your application will not be reviewed at all. It will be returned unreviewed uh, with no consideration for that. You will have the ability to enter five references, and you will rank them first, second, third, fourth, fifth. So let's say first and second. Um, something happens, life happens, they're not able to get that letter of recommendation in at, on time and therefore it's not considered. Well, you will have your third, your fourth there as well. And if your fifth does it, you can have three letters of recommendation considered. So that's going to be an opportunity that you have there as well. And uh, that is something that you do wanna get started on early. Who are your references going to be and talk to them, get their permission. Letters of recommendation can be a very political thing and a very sensitive thing. So this is not something that you want to wait until the last minute. Um, your references must be from non-family uh, and preferably from professors and researchers. They need to be familiar with you as a person as well as with your work, whether that is you as a student, you as a researcher. So uh, it's going to also be who's best for you. You might have one of your best references be an English professor or a geography professor rather than your chemistry faculty advisor for your undergraduate. Um, well, hopefully them as well, um, but you need to have two or three. So it could be these other individuals, maybe not in your area of STEM. Um, your reference writer can be from industry. Um, so we do have a number of applicants who they graduated from undergrad, they went and worked in a lab for five or 10 years, and they want to have their supervisor or um, a leader within that organization write them a letter of recommendation. That's A-OK. -okay. Absolutely encouraged to do. However, if they are coming from industry, there's a big chance that those industry leaders don't understand what they're writing a letter of recommendation for. So you'll want to make sure they understand what GRFP is and make sure that all of your references really have access to your personal statement and your research statement as much as you are comfortable so that they have an understanding of what you are proposing as well. Uh, an industry letter of recommendation oftentimes is, uh, yes, this is a great employee. I would hire them again. They worked on so many great projects. Um, and NSF does not want to see that. They want to see this person worked in my lab in, in a private industry. They, uh, they were good scientists for X, Y, Z reasons. They really led these projects. Um, they really have an understanding of how to conduct scientific experiments. Uh, they might mention something about federal regulations that we've had to work within within our lab and how this, this applicant has a very good understanding of that. Those are going to be valuable things to have in your letter of recommendation. Some important considerations here. We're looking to fund you, not just your research. And really importantly here, not your PI's research. So you need to take ownership of what you are proposing here. You need to have 
previous research experience and evidence of research productivity. Um, I get questions every year. I've never conducted scientific research. Do I have a chance? Very little. Um, do, do I have to have published? Can I apply without having published? Absolutely, and you still have a very high chance of success. But you do need to have previous research experience. And you also do need to have a strong GPA. I don't define what a strong GPA is here because I don't want to place barriers. Um, you may have had a rough start to college where you had a really rough GPA, but once you got into your major, once you got into physics or chemistry or biology, you really found your element and you really excelled and you had a really good GPA within your major. Um, overall, it might not look the greatest, but in your major, it might look really great. So that would be for you a strong GPA. Um, and that would also be an opportunity for you to talk about in your in your personal statement, how starting college was a challenge, and here's how I overcame that challenge and came to excel in my studies. Um, so if that does describe you, be sure to weave that into your personal narrative. Um, the outreach goals of the NSF, they do want to attract uh, diverse and qualified applicants. So if you have attended a minor minority serving institution or plan to as a graduate student. If you come from an EPSCOR jurisdiction, which I'll go over the list of that in a second, or if you are a non-traditional student, you are highly, highly encouraged to pursue the GRFP. Now, EPSCOR, this is an established program to simulate competitive research. So this is uh, states and territories that don't have as comp competitive of an edge on STEM as other areas. And so they really want to support students who come from those areas, as well as students who plan to go and pursue uh, their education in these EPSCOR jurisdictions. And so this is the list. And so again, if you have a background in this area, if you went to undergrad in this area, or if you um, will be pursuing a graduate degree in th these areas, be sure to weave that into your narrative as well. So Alabama, Arkansas, Delaware, Guam, Hawaii, Idaho, Iowa, Kansas, Kentucky, Louisiana, Maine, Mississippi, Montana, Nebraska, Nevada, New Hampshire, New Mexico, North Dakota, Oklahoma, Puerto Rico, Rhode Island, South Carolina, South Dakota, U.S. Virgin Islands, Vermont, West Virginia, and Wyoming. And another plug here again, non-traditional students, we encourage you to please apply if you are interested and eligible, but you also have a very compel compelling facet here that you want to uh, weave into your narrative and you also do need to describe because your, your reviewers will see your academic history. And if you took 15 years off between your last time in school and now that when you are pursuing a PhD and pursuing the GRP, there's going to be questions, and that's going to only help you in uh, your competitiveness to discuss that. Specifically, you want to talk about why back to school now? What led you to this decision? Uh, why grad school in general, and why this area? And what is your motivation to take this step, and why are you taking that step right now? So these are some compelling whys that you do want to weave into your narrative. Okay, some common weaknesses. An unorganized personal statement that doesn't clear, tell a clear story. At the beginning, I said you want to have a thematic uh, statement. Uh, and I recommend that you go past, present, future. It tells a story. Um, and chronology definitely does help with the clarity. Um, so an unorganized statement. You can utilize headers to section off things that can help organize as well. So don't just have a long narrative of prose that does not tell a story. Uh, a research statement that is unclear, incomplete, and unpolished, another common weakness. Uh, you, th this is where you have too little or too much detail. In Sweden, uh, I, I, I'm a Swede, this is something that we call logom. It's, it's not too much, not too little, just right. You wanna have that nice little Goldilocks space with the amount of detail that you describe your research. Uh, failure to own your research. This is super important here, and I can't accentuate this enough. Own your experience. We There's a humility that we have um, when it comes to our contributions here, especially when we're students. I didn't work in a lab. Uh, I 
we worked in a lab. I didn't uh, achieve X, Y, Z. We did the lab, all the postdocs, the research associates, the PI. We did X, Y, Z. That's great. Talk about the big picture that you helped achieve in your lab, but then talk about what you did specifically. We're, we're all working within the construct of the machine, but what is your cog? Why is your cog important? And that's where you want to own your experience, uh, own the research that you conducted, whatever part of that research uh, spectrum it was, own it, talk about it. And then lacking recognition of those research risks. Talk about your plan B. Dense writing that is too difficult to understand or is uninteresting and too much jargon as well as failure to address your broader impacts. Graduate students are very well trained to talk about the impact of science. So that intellectual merit, you're generally very well trained and don't have much trouble with that in your statements, but it's the broader impacts where students tend to have an, a weakness. What can you do now? For those of you who are undergrads, continue working on any research projects that you are working on. Identify your potential reference writers. This could be a PI that you're working with. This could be um, if you are engaging in the undergraduate research program here at the University of Utah. It could be someone from within that program. It could be a faculty member within your program or your senior capstone advisor. Uh, develop your research question. As an undergraduate, you don't need to have this as fleshed out as others might be. Some of you on the call are juniors going into your senior year next year and have not even started applying to graduate programs. So when you are reviewed as a GRFP applicant, there are three tiers, second year grad student, first year grad student, and rising senior. And so the further you are in your education, the more finite the expectation will be. So if you, you're saying to me on the other side of the screen, I, I, I'm a junior, I, I still have more undergrad to do. I, I, I know what I'm interested in researching. I know the type of project I want to do. I'm not prepared to talk about X, Y, Z. Well, that's taken into consideration in the review because you'll be in that base level. When you're a first year grad student, October, you're, you're a month and a half into your grad program. So you, you're going to have a higher expectation because you finished undergrad, you have that degree, you have more research experience than the rising seniors do. And then when you're a second year, you're going into, for many of you, your second year is going to be your last year of coursework. So you have a more research experience than others. You have a lot more theory and um, me method knowledge and experience than others do. So you're going to have the stricter review at the top as a second year. So develop your research question as an undergrad as best as you are able to, but understand that we recognize there are those limitations. And then also articulate a graduate school plan. You've not even started applying for grad school yet. You might not know which uh, school you want to go to. You might not have uh, reach out to potential PIs. You don't have to have been accepted or even applied yet, but you do need to be able to speak to your interests and your opportunities. What are you looking for in a grad program? Um, are you considering a handful right now and you've not decided which to apply to talk about that? If you are a current or incoming graduate student, uh, you uh, what you can do now is going to be a little different. You want to work with your current faculty advisor and PI to develop your research plan. They are your key partner with the GRFP, with any other fellowship that you pursue, and your research and dissertation in general. Um, so you want to work closely with them. They are also going to be your most valuable letter of recommendation. So work closely with them and let them be a partner, not a uh, uh, a partner in this process, not someone from the periphery. <clears throat> Speak specifically about your grad school choice. Why did you choose your program? Why did you choose that PI? If you chose that PI, some of you will be admitted into graduate programs where you are assigned to PI from the get-go. Um, and you need to have a firm research plan. This should be more specific when, than when you are an undergrad. And if you are a second-year grad student, this needs to be as specific as possible. 
you can also read the 2022 solicitation. The 2023 will be available in end of June, early July, and that's going to have the specifics for this upcoming year. But for the most part, uh, the 2023 solicitation for the GRFP will be very similar to the 2022. The deadline dates will be a little off and there might be some formatting changes, but for the most part, it'll be the same. You need to make a plan between today and the October deadlines. So you don't want to spend three weeks under the coercion of a deadline rapidly trying to put everything together. You want to give yourself time so that you're able to put together as thoughtful of a uh, research application here as possible. Move along any research projects that you have and finish any pending articles. As I said, you don't have to have published, but if you are able to publish, that will only help you. Thematically organize your personal statement and begin drafting statements early and go through multiple drafts with your faculty and your peers. Okay, and sounds like uh, there is going to, there's a little bit of audio trouble here. Um, it might be an internet connection on your side. Um, if that is the case, uh, you will be able to refer back to this on our website if, if certain parts are not coming in clear. Okay. Okay, now we're going to go through some rapid fire frequently asked questions. Some of these might be your questions that we might be able to answer right now, and then we'll have time for your questions at the end. How many times can I apply? As an undergraduate, there is no restriction in the number of applications prior to enrolling in a graduate program. The caveat there is if you get the fellowship, you have to be in a graduate program that fall, that following fall. So for this upcoming cycle, that means you must be in a grad program uh, by uh, fall 2024. Uh, but once you are a grad student, you can apply once, either as a first year or as a second year. You cannot apply twice as a graduate student. And if you are in a joint baccalaureate master's program, you can apply once. I'm graduating soon with a bachelor's degree, but plan to take a year off. Will the NSF allow me to defer the award? Uh, for the most part, that is no, but that depends on uh, the reason for the deferral. If you're just trying to take a gap year, that's going to be a no. If you have military service during that following year, you can defer for military. If you have medical reason, uh, for that deferment, then you can defer your GRFP. Um, however, though, if, if, if it is medical or military, that must be a, a deferment that is approved through your institution that you plan to attend. Um, so uh, if you have something medical going on and you need to take a year off of school, that does need to be approved by the institution you plan to attend before the NSF will approve it. I'm starting graduate school this fall, but I've taken a year of non-matriculated courses. Does this count towards my time in a graduate program? No. Uh, the NSF will only count time in a matriculated program uh, or degree-seeking program. So if you've taken grad courses to help make yourself more competitive for admission into a program, that does not count as graduate education. Once you are admitted into the master's or PhD program, that's when the clock does begin. So if you spent a year or some of you may have spent more than one year after bachelor's degree, taking some grad classes to really prepare for grad school, maybe improve your GPA, get a little bit more research experience, decide if this is really the path you wanna go down, um, that time will not count because it's not degree seeking. Applying as a grad student, is it more important for me to reflect on my graduate experience rather than my undergraduate? Is there a secret formula? There is no secret formula. The secret here is whatever is best for you. So uh, you'll want to focus on the experience that is most meaningful to your story. You will need to reference your grad program uh, if you're a current grad student, but let's say that you're applying as a first year grad student. You've been in school for four to eight weeks by the time you submit the application. Your experience is not necessarily rich, but let's say that your junior and senior year of college were really, really research heavy or very meaningful to your path as a scientist. That might be the bulk of your narrative. That's perfectly okay. And you can still be very successful if that is the case. 
I'm in the first year of a PhD program, but previously earned a master's. Am I eligible? Uh, for the most part, no, but there is a caveat here. Uh, having a master's generally does make you ineligible. However, if you got your master's and then you took off two or more years of uh, between completing that master's and starting a PhD, then you would be eligible uh, to apply. Um, the, the NSF does not want to fund students who've already been to grad school uh, um, in that same kind of track. So getting your, your master's and then uh, without skipping a beat, going directly into PhD, why did you not pursue this as a master's student? That sort of thing. Um, but if you did take time off, and this is not uncommon to get a master's degree. Uh, I, I've had some students who've gotten the GRFP. They got biomedical bachelor's, for example, then they got an MBA to uh, rise up in leadership in their biomedical engineering private sector job. And then after five years, they want to go back and get a PhD and focus on their PhD program. They would then be eligible to go back and apply for the GRFP. So if that describes you, as long as there's two years or more of uninterrupt, uh, of continuous interruption in graduate study, you're good. As I look forward to graduate school, I'd like to concurrently earn an MBA or a different professional degree. Is this allowable? No, this is not allowable. You cannot be pursuing a professional non-research degree as, as an NSF fellow. So let's say that you um, finish uh, your GRF, five years have gone by and you're still in college and you want to pursue an MBA, that's fine, your fellowship is over. Uh, but there is strict guidance for institutions of higher education here. I'm, I'm the coordinating official, so I'm, I'm the one who does this look up here. If you are admitted into an MBA program, for example, you would lose your, your uh, GRF because the NSF does want you to focus on your research, not on other degrees while they are funding you. Are there citizenship requirements? Yes, you must be a United States citizen or permanent resident. And this is unfortunately non-negotiable. Can I apply for the GRFP if I'm planning to attend a foreign institution? No, you must be attending a United States institution of higher education and enrolled in a qualifying research master's or doctoral program. However, and this is a big however, um, if you are conducting research or collaborating at a foreign institution, that is A-OK. -okay. So let's say you are studying here at the University of Utah and you are going to, um, the, to Lund University in Sweden and you're going to collaborate with the researchers there as you do your data collection and work on your research project. Well, you're enrolled here at the University of Utah. You're in a program here and you're taking dissertation credits while doing that research, but you're going to physically be in Sweden working with another university to conduct that research. That is fine. I'm applying as an undergrad and I'm not sure where I'll be attending grad school next year. Will this be a problem? No, the NSF does understand that applicants, particularly uh, current undergrads, don't necessarily have your plans fully settled. Um, and also I'll point out, you're not bound to stay at the same institution. So if you are applying as an undergrad here at the University of Utah, as much as I would like to say, stay here at the University of Utah for your PhD, you do not have to stay here for your PhD. If you're a first year PhD student here at the University of Utah, you can also go to another institution as a second year PhD elsewhere. That is also allowable because it is mobile. It is a funding for you, not funding for your institution. I'm not planning to attend an Ivy League or elite university. Will I still have a chance? Absolutely. The NSF values diversity among institutions, programs, topics, and people, including that diversity is minority serving institution, institutions and EBSCOR territories. Um, I've worked on papers not ready for publication. Will this be a problem? It, 
is it a problem if I don't have any publications? Publications will enhance your application and they will be very helpful. However, they are not required. You can still be a completely, fully successful uh, fellowship applicant receiving the fellowship without publications. If they are not ready, if you are working on publications and they are just not ready by the time of the application submission uh, to be submitted, talk about what you are working on, the reference the journals that you plan to submit to, or you might be under review with a journal, go ahead and mention that as well. I'm an undergrad and I've worked in a research lab outside my program. Can that PI write a letter of recommendation? Absolutely, because that PI is going to be familiar with you as a researcher and that's going to be a valuable recommendation. So absolutely. I worked in the industry before heading to grad school. Can an industry professional write a letter of recommendation? Absolutely. You just want to make sure that they understand what the GRFP is and uh, what they need to be saying about a letter of recommendation. It's not a job recommendation. It is an academic recommendation. So their, their recommendation can be very valuable. Uh, they just need to be clear of what they are what they need to be referencing. And that is your research, you as a researcher, you as a scholar, you as a leader. When are applications due? They are due in October. And when will you be notified of the results? You will be notified at the beginning of April. Um, the past couple of years, it's been the last couple of days of March. Uh, so it, it does tend to be early April, um, not late April. And the portal will open in, I believe, August late July, early August for you to begin work building your application. I do have some upcoming workshops and you all are on my listserv. So you'll be, be receiving notifications of other info sessions like this, as well as my upcoming application prep series. Um, May 18th, we'll have a program overview, which will be pretty much what you saw today. So being there on the 18th uh, might not be of interest to you. On the 25th, we will specifically discuss personal statements, June 1st, specifically research statements, and on June 8th, broader impacts, um, specifically hitting those broader impacts. And then in the fall and September and early October, I will also be hosting um, writing workshops uh, during the day, during the evening, and on the weekend. Uh, so you'll have opportunity to come and uh, have either me, a, a current GRFP, or um, your peers review your uh, your writing, provide some feedback and for you to ask questions. And some students will use those uh, final writing workshops as a final check. Do I have everything? Is my application good to go? And so you're welcome to participate in those. And again, you're on my listserv, so you'll be receiving these. And then any questions that you have, feel free to reach out to me, fellowships at gradschool.utah.edu. I also can provide one-on-one -on -one advising. So if that is something that you're interested in, you would reach out to me at that email address to schedule an appointment. And so at this point, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. I think, uh, okay, my computer froze there for a second.